Welcome everybody and in this presentation I just want to give you a, a general introduction into some of the expectations for um, the first lab as well as just to give you kind of a broad foundational understanding of these things that we call the dimensions of wellness. So first of all, uh, this week you have your lab, first lab due, lab number one, which is your health and wellness lab. Um, I typically don't give examples only because I find that almost all the students that view the examples tend to just copy and paste or to almost reword the exact example that I've provided. And what happens with this is just it just requires no thought, no planning, no initial work in advance, no creativity. So when anytime that there's an example, which I rarely do, don't just mimic the example still. Just use the example as an idea, as a guide um, into what's expected. But for your first lab, take a look at the general um, expectations and instructions for the lab. There are four different sections to this lab. The first section is just, in your own words, defining what health and wellness means. Now when you do this, be sure you are thorough and comprehensive in your uh, explanation or your reflection or evaluation. And all these labs can be written in first person, so don't feel like that it's a more of a research-based paper. It is a personal reflection. I want you to seriously think about these things and to really just kind of give some reflection based on what you know, what you've learned, what you've experienced. So in your definition, it doesn't require that you have previously read anything, but I just want to see how much you understand. Are these terms the same? What does health mean to you? What does wellness mean to you? And then think about how did you come to these these definitions. What things have you experienced that have caused you to believe one way or another? So kind of elaborate on your thoughts. After you provide your first initial paragraph and your defining of that, you're going to reflect on any habits or behaviors, personal things that you have um, as it relates to overall wellness. So as you can see in the instructions in part B, it says discuss two specific habits or behaviors and then describe and explain one that contribute to the improvement of your health and wellness and one that you think places you at risk. So here you're going to talk about two different things. Um, for both of those things you're going to talk about something that is beneficial as well as something that may have some negative consequences. And then you're going to think about the choices you've made in part C. You are going to describe two choices you've made. You're going to talk about one choice which has had some negative outcome and this can be anything from your childhood up into present day. Just whatever you remember that relates to the assignment. And then to one which that has had one which has had a positive outcome, so a negative outcome and a positive outcome. And then discuss the responsibility you you've taken or should have taken as it relates to both of these and how they have affected you and what you learned from them. And then in part D, characteristics. Identify and discuss some strong positive habits or characteristics that you possess. So here's where you get to brag about yourself a little bit. I know people don't like to do that, but just go ahead and think about what strong characteristics. Do you have? What would others say are your strong characteristics and why? And how have you used those to demonstrate that they're your strengths? And then in addition, just kind of I want you to mention some areas in which you know that you need some improvement in and why you think you need some improvement in those areas and how you think that improvement um, can be beneficial to you. So when you are thinking about your lab, it's going to be very comprehensive. Someone always asks me, how long does this have to be? you will find that I do not provide page lengths. What my initial philosophy is, is quality over quantity. If you have provided a comprehensive, thorough review into all of the guiding questions and the sections that need to be addressed, um, sometimes you can do that in four pages. Some people will do it in seven pages. It just really depends on how well you are articulating yourself. So just elaborate be comprehensive, be thorough, explain yourself completely, provide details, provide examples, and however long it takes you to do that, great. Um, so here's a quick example of what I may call a, a well-done lab. So as you start to read this lab, you'll notice that they have several different citations in text within this lab, which means this individual has done some research. They've looked into a lot of different articles as it relates to the topic and the content being discussed. So be sure that you have had some type of foundation um, grounded in research when you are explaining yourself. Now some people get confused. Well if it's a first person type of paper why do I need um, citations? It adds credibility. It provides a better well-rounded paper. If you were just saying something basically what it is it's just your personal thoughts but I want to know how those personal thoughts have been formed what have you read? 
what are some of the things that you have compared your thoughts with because that not only makes you a more intelligent individual it makes you a better writer as well so if you take a look at some of those you can see how the, um, the citations are, are included in text and then just a quick note on APA if you see this one uh, take a look at this example of an in-text citation you don't need the page number unless you are providing a direct quotation so if you have something in quotes then your citation needs to include the author's uh, last name, the year of the publication, as well as the page number where you can find that, those quotes on. So that just gives you a little example on how to complete this lab. If you still have any questions, I mean, feel free to reach out to me. Don't think that you're bothering me. I look forward to discussing and explaining um, some of the expectations with you. So as we talk about health and wellness and start to introduce ourselves into all these concepts of wellness, here are just some thoughts. Initially, and this relates to the lab as well, what do those terms actually mean? What are the purposes of understanding these terms and how do we take that information and apply it to our lives to make us better? And why do we even need to know that information? Um, also, what determines our state of health and well-being? How do we define that and how do we know that we are experiencing health and well-being? Um, how do we measure it? How do we determine that we are healthy? Is it just because we feel good? Is it because a doctor told us so? Is it because we are able to complete a variety of tasks as it relates to these dimensions of wellness and overall health and wellness um, without any problem? Uh, what, whatever it is, we need to start thinking about how we determine, measure, assess what our health and wellness states are. And then how do we practice being healthy and well? Some people say it's just eating right, it's exercising but it goes a lot deeper in that, which we'll investigate further throughout this course. And then what do you know about wellness, but are not practicing it? And this is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. If you know something, but you are not doing it, then you have to ask yourself, well, why? And we see this happening all the time. There are so many areas of our life that we know um, the benefits of, that we know that we should be doing, but for some reason we're not doing it. The same thing applies to our overall health and wellness. And so just think about those things as we progress. Um, some of the terms just to clarify and define that a lot of people use but are really unsure about what they mean. Um, just understand these definitions. When we say we're of sound mind, we're of sound body, basically what we are saying is just we don't have any issues or concerns. We don't have an injury. We don't have a problem. We don't have a disease. We're not sick. We're sound. And so thinking of being sound simply just means that free from that injury, free from disease, free from problems. Um, when we think about our well-being, we hear this term used a lot of different ways. Basically what that means is we are in good or satisfactory condition as it relates to others around us. Um, so basically from ourselves, thinking about how we feel in, in comparison to those around us and our peers and friends and other community members, um, if we're okay, we're, we're taking care of our well-being. Balance is this basically a, a, a steadiness, this surety that we understand and that we recognize different problems that we are having, whether it be in our health and wellness, whether it be in our social wellness, whether it be in our spiritual wellness, we understand that. So balance is that mental steadiness, that understanding, that recognizing that Yes, there are some problems and we need to do something about those problems. Um, so having that understanding is having balance in our lives and then being fulfilled. When we are fulfilled or experiencing a fulfilling lifestyle, it means we've done something that we think is uh, recognizable, something that we have personally set out to accomplish and we've accomplished that. We've achieved something. We've finished a particular goal that we've been working on. That means we are experiencing something that has fulfilled us. And so understanding the technical the actual technical use of these terms is important for us to understand um, how we approach these different dimensions of wellness so what this course really hopes to do is to get you to understand what I call the stewardship of the body and basically it's understanding that we need to take care of something that is not our own if I were to give you something valuable um, something extremely e expensive and say take care of this um, you know it's not your own. Typically, we will value and take care of things that um, belong to someone else more so than we do those things that belong to us. And so being a good steward means we are entrusted with the care, the welfare, the management of something that doesn't belong to us. We don't belong to ourselves. The Bible tells us that we belong to God. And so if we truly believe that, we need to be good stewards of our own body. So being a good steward 
of our body means we need to maintain our body. We need to maintain it in good condition. We need to focus on what our strengths are, understand our weaknesses, and work towards improving those weaknesses. We need to protect it. We need to protect it from any type of harm, danger, and that means from the things that we eat to the things that we do and we engage in. So we need to make sure that our bodies are protected. We need to nurture our bodies. And so we think about how we treat our children. We nurture our children. We want to take precautions to make sure that they are well taken care of. We need to do the same for ourselves. We need to demonstrate a sense of self-love. And then we need to develop it. We need to make sure that we recognize our strengths and weaknesses. We need to make sure that we are working towards, on a consistent basis, towards uh, utilizing our strengths and improving those weaknesses. And so we need to be actively doing something to improve ourselves, not just keeping us in a particular condition, but working towards overall self-improvement. So if we're doing those things, we are demonstrating that we understand what stewardship of the body means. And, and the doing is the hard part. We understand a lot of it, but getting to the action part is, is difficult. And so you'll see Health and wellness define a lot of different ways. If we just take a look at the Webster's Dictionary, basically it states health is a condition of being sound in body, mind, spirit, especially freedom from disease or pain. So if we're just taking this definition um, at heart, basically based on what it says, if we're sick, we're not experiencing health or wellness. So health based on the Webster's Dictionary just simply states we're in good condition. Now, if we look at the National Wellness Association, the NWA, um, not to be confused with one of the uh, old rap group. Um, health and wellness is an active process of becoming aware of and making choices towards a more successful existence. So now we incorporate that action part, that personal responsibility. Not only are we aware of something, we are doing something as well. And then the Arizona State University, who is probably one of the uh, leading institutions on research related to health and wellness, they define it this way. They say wellness is an active, lifelong process of becoming aware of, um, aware of choices and making decisions towards a more balanced and fulfilling life. And so there's a lot more involved in that in-depth definition as to how Arizona State defines health and wellness. So they look at it as two different things. They say wellness individually, not necessarily health, but focusing on wellness is something that is ongoing. It's not something that we obtain and then we stop, but it's consistent, something we have to always consciously be aware of um, and work towards doing it so we have the sense of being fulfilled. Now, if we look at our textbook definition, um, Harper separates the two. He looks at wellness as a combination of just the physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, and then health as a condition of being sound in body, mind, and spirit, and not merely the absence of disease. And so he kind of splits these off and identifies these as two separate things. Um, and defining health and wellness kind of re reflects back on where we got this term wellness. Now, Dr. Halbert Dunn actually coined this term wellness based on a series of short papers that he had in addition to some research that he was doing when he was uh, observing um, the elderly and, and the different ways that they started to approach life and how they started to deteriorate physically as well as mentally, um, socially, and emotionally. And so he looked at this as an integrated method of functioning, which means a lot of different components are at work here, which is oriented towards maximizing the potential of which the individual is capable. So now, regardless of what state you're in, if you're sick, um, if you're disabled, um, if you're missing limbs, if you were born with a, a deformity, whatever it was, he says you still have some form of potential in which you can contribute to a quality of life. And so whatever you're capable of doing it, understanding that and working towards that is part of being well. So it requires that the individual maintain this continuum of balance and purposeful direction within the environment which he or she is functioning. So there's a lot that goes in to that initial definition of overall health and wellness. Now here's something I want you to do. I'm going to post 10 different things on the screen here and I want you to rank these from most important to least important. So from one being most important to 10 uh, being least important to you. Um, so which one of these would you identify as being the most important um, of, of the list? I'm not, I don't want to give you too much detailed information to kind of pigeonhole you, but just leaving it open like that. Which one of these is most important? Is it the food selection you have? Is it understanding weight management, trying to manage your weight, recreation, 
exercise. And this all relates to you personally right now, um, based on your lifestyle, based on what you know, how would you rate these things from the most important? So take a moment, rank these from one to 10. Um, pause the video because when we come back in just a second, I'm going to ask you to do something else um, next to your ranked order list. So from one to 10, most important number one, least important number 10. Okay, coming back now, after you have ranked this list, the next thing I want you to do is now put a number next to the one, another ranking kind of, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily put them in order, but just kind of the number next to what you already have based on how much attention you give it. So if you give something a significant amount of attention, I want you to rank, rate that as number one. So number one being the one that you give the most attention to. So you may um, identify uh, spirituality, for example, as being the most important on your initial list, but you may not give that any attention any time. You may not be attending a well-balanced church. You may not be involved in Bible reading. You may not have a Bible study. You may not necessarily think those things are important right now. Although you identify it as being important, you're not actively engaged in anything. So the purpose of that is to see if anything is out of sync. Because if you rank something as important, you should be devoting some time and attention to that to demonstrate the importance of that. And oftentimes, this list of things is completely out of sync for us. And if this simple list is out of sync, can you imagine the other things that we experience that are also out of sync that can be affecting our overall health and wellness? So when we think about health and wellness more in depth, we think of these eight points of high-level wellness. Now, throughout research, They've identified eight different things um, as being considered what people in, uh, engage in, what people experience, and have identified as being high in their levels of wellness. So number one, the ability to face inconsistencies in our thinking. This means we are not of a fixed mindset. We are able to be open. We are able to be flexible in our understanding. We are able to recognize that um, there are a lot of different factors, opinions towards one particular issue. Um, and so being able to face those inconsistencies in our thinking is an important point of being uh, mentally and emotionally well, not just physically well, but mentally and emotionally also. Also being able to hear and examine the viewpoints of others with this open mind. So engaging in some type of conversation with individuals whose beliefs may conflict with ours is healthy. It's good to do. It helps us to really solidify why we believe what we believe and why we feel the way we do about particular issues. Number three, encourage freedom of expression of those around us. So allowing others to speak freely and to share their own personal viewpoints, thoughts, and opinions without demeaning them, without bashing them, without um, conflicting with them to a point where you are just uh, really kind of ignoring what they are trying to say. And then being able to adjust your own views. For example, for me, I grew up as a Jehovah Witness. Uh, I reached a point in my life when I decided to investigate that when I started to hear some conflicting stories with what some of my friends were being taught and whether they were uh, considered Christians at the time with some of the things that I was taught in the Kingdom Hall. And so I launched this investigation into what I thought was true and factual, what I was taught as, you know, as a child growing up. And I found a lot of inconsistencies. And based on those inconsistencies, I realized that the teachings of the Kingdom Hall were not aligned with Scripture. And so I was able to adjust my own viewpoints and later on come to a point where um, I really believed in Bible-rooted Christianity. And so being able to adjust your own views is an important component of wellness as well. Making time for unhurried contacts with others, being sure that we are flexible enough that we give others our time. Others are in need of some of the things that we have um, whether it just be discussion, whether it be time, attention, some help, making sure that we allow ourselves to be open and flexible to offer that when we have the time. Determination to give credit and recognition to others when it's due. A basic human need is to have recognition. And being able to recognize the values of others is an important quality of wellness. And then being able to serve others. So being willing and being able to do that as well. And then giving freedom to those we love to choose or choose otherwise. Um, being able to extend that understanding to other people. So all of these things are considered high levels of wellness in which individuals who experience positive wellness seem to possess and consistently engage in. So other qualities of the most healthy and well, 
high self-esteem. Now, there are a lot of things that we can experience growing up, uh, child-rearing age, that may affect our self-esteem, but trying to overcome that is important. And so high self-esteem is a good quality of the most well, a positive outlook. I'm looking at things optimistically as opposed to pessimistically. Strong personal responsibility, being able to laugh at ourselves and others as well. Uh, a concern for others, a genuine concern, not just this kind of idle understanding, so concerned, that, hey, how you doing? Good, and move on. It's more so, um, what do you need? How can I help you? Do I have the resources to be of assistance? Do I have the knowledge to help you out? So a genuine concern for others is important. Freedom from risky behaviors. We'll talk a lot more about risky behaviors later, later throughout this course, but basically those are anything... Uh, the, anything that we can do that we engage in that can cause harm to ourselves or others around us. Uh, being able to cope with our problems, um, having some coping mechanisms in place so that we don't tend to fall into these risky behaviors. Having some stress management plans in place because we will get stress and what we do with that stress can affect our overall health and wellness. Being in good physical condition, taking care of our body, and being able to empathize, and that goes back to the concern for others. Not just an understanding, not just having sympathy, but truly putting ourselves in a place of understanding where we can just about feel what others are going through. So having that sense of empathy. And then we look at all the different dimensions of wellness, which we will cover throughout this course. The physical, spiritual, social, emotional, intellectual, and then occupational and environmental are not necessarily considered core dimensions of wellness, but these are some of the things that you may find other people have identified as important dimensions of wellness. Um, occupational and environmental are not necessarily considered cores because we do not necessarily have direct control over those things. Sometimes we can plan for and seek out a particular job or occupation, but we oftentimes find ourselves in a position because we need to survive, because we need to make an income, just choosing a job or choosing something just so we can make a living. So we don't necessarily uh, have 100% control in that particular environment. Same thing in our overall environment. Uh, where we live, our air quality, um, our community, we don't necessarily have control over that as well. And so the others we do have direct control and personal responsibility and taking care of, which is why they're considered the core dimensions of wellness. But occupational and environmental are other things that are um, important and important to understand how they relate to our overall health and wellness as well. So just some thoughts. Wellness transcends the idea of freedom from disease, illness, and debilitating conditions. Um, so it's more than just feeling well. Uh, consider how age, heredity, and experiences can affect our overall health and wellness. As we grow old, um, our health and wellness will start to decline. There are some things that we can't do, but knowing that means we should be more proactive uh, in taking advantage of some of the benefits of the health and wellnesses that we're going to experience. And wellness is ongoing. It's not something that we end once we feel that we've reached a particular point. Um, it ba it's based on our lives, our experiences, the environment, and it's continually changing. Everything adjusts. Some of the questions I ask you today will have a different response if I ask you several months from now. And so our overall wellness is going to be flexible. It is going to change. So the bottom line is that we need to be accountable. We need to be responsible for our overall health, for our overall wellness as well. So some of the things that we need to do, we need to be able to gain a sense of humor, um, recognize how humor can be medicinal and beneficial for us, not only in our emotional state, but our physical state as well. Work on having a positive attitude. Think about the quality of life, the things that we can engage in, that we can contribute to that are productive and beneficial, not only to ourselves, but to others. Um, it increases our lifespan. So if we are able to have a better sense of overall health and wellness, it adds years to our life. Um, seeking a sense of balance, spiritual significance, fulfilling relationships, reduced health problems, stress management, increased productivity. These are all outcomes and benefits of being healthy, of being well. And so as we take a look at all the different dimensions of wellness that we're going to discuss throughout this course, I want you to think about how all of those are intertwined and how they connect to apply to every area of our lives. And then we can recognize, well, these are some of the areas in which I'm weak in. Here are some things that I need to do to be beneficial, and this is why those things can be beneficial. And that's really the bottom line to investigating how we can look at all the different dimensions of wellness and improve in those areas. So if you have any questions on this information, feel free to ask. There'll be more uh, presentations, PowerPoints, and 
uh, information to, to come. So take care for now.